Chapter 4, Misleading, Amplifying. There are often valuable lessons that can be gleaned from one discipline that are applicable to unrelated ones. For instance, the billion-year chronicle of ice ages can teach us a great deal about multiplying your wealth. Our knowledge of the natural world is relatively recent, despite its apparent vastness. In many cases, comprehending how the universe operates requires extensive investigation that delves beneath its surface. This was an endeavor that was impossible until relatively recently. Isaac Newton formulated calculations for the motion of celestial bodies hundreds of years prior to our understanding of some of the fundamentals of our planet. It wasn't until the 1800s that the scientific community reached a consensus that the Earth had gone through numerous periods of glaciation. Superscript 1 The vast quantity of evidence available made it impossible to argue otherwise. Across the globe, remnants of a bygone era of frozen temperatures could be found in the form of enormous boulders scattered haphazardly and scraped bedrock. It became evident that there were not one but five distinct ice ages that we could measure. The amount of energy necessary to freeze the entire planet, thaw it out, and then refreeze it is staggering. The force behind these cycles must be the most potent one on our planet. And indeed it is. However, it operates differently than anyone initially thought. Multiple theories attempted to explain the cause of ice ages, and all of them were equally grandiose to account for their vast geological influence. For example, some suggested that the uplift of mountain ranges may have altered the climate by shifting the Earth's winds, while others thought that ice was the planet's natural state, disrupted by massive volcanic eruptions that heated up the planet. However, none of these theories could explain the cyclical repetition of five ice ages. While mountain range growth or a massive volcanic eruption may explain one ice age, it cannot justify the recurrence of ice ages. In the early 1900s, a Serbian scientist named Milutin Milanković analyzed the Earth's position in relation to other planets and formulated the now accepted theory of ice ages. The gravitational pull of the Sun and Moon slightly affects the Earth's motion and tilt toward the Sun. During parts of this cycle, which can last tens of thousands of years, each hemisphere receives either slightly more or less solar radiation than it is accustomed to. Revised section, The Fascinating Science of Ice Ages and this is where things get intriguing. Milankovitch's theory initially assumed that the Earth's hemisphere's tilt caused frigid winters, cold enough to transform the planet into an ice-covered wasteland. However, a Russian meteorologist named Vladimir Koppen delved deeper into Milankovitch's research and discovered an intriguing subtlety. The culprit for the ice ages was moderately cool summers not cold winters. It all starts when a summer fails to get warm enough to melt the snow from the previous winter. The leftover ice base facilitates snow accumulation the following winter, increasing the odds of snow sticking around in the following summer. This attracts even more accumulation the next winter, and perpetual snow reflects more of the sun's rays, exacerbating cooling, which leads to more snowfall, and so on. Within a few centuries, a seasonal snowpack grows into a continental ice sheet, and the cycle continues. It's amazing how small changes in conditions can lead to big outcomes. In the case of ice ages, a layer of snow that persists can result in a continental ice sheet. The reverse also holds. Increased sunlight can melt more snow and lead to a cycle of warming. Glaciologist Gwen Schultz highlights that it's not the amount of snow that creates ice sheets, but rather the fact that any snow endures. This teaches us that significant results don't always require tremendous force. Rather, if growth compounds, a modest beginning can result in exceptional outcomes that may seem illogical. This phenomenon may even lead to underestimating what's achievable, the source of growth, and its potential. This lesson is also applicable to finance. Over 2,000 books have been written on Warren Buffett's wealth creation. Although many are excellent, few adequately acknowledge the simplest truth. Buffett's wealth did not come from being only a competent investor, but from being a competent investor since his youth. At the time of writing this, 
Warren Buffett's net worth is $84.5 billion, with $84.2 billion accumulated after turning 50 years old, and $81.5 billion after qualifying for Social Security in his mid-60s. Warren Buffett's success stems from his incredible investment skills for over 75 years, not just from his investing expertise. If he had begun investing in his 30s and retired in his 60s, he would not have become as famous. Imagine a hypothetical scenario for a moment. Warren Buffett started investing seriously when he was just 10 years old. By the time he was 30, he had a net worth of $1 million which amounts to $9. 3 million when adjusted for inflation. Superscript 1 Now, let's suppose that instead of investing heavily in his youth, he had spent his teenage and early adult years exploring the world, discovering his passions, and had a net worth of, say, $25,000 at the age of 30. However, let's assume he still managed to achieve the same remarkable annual investment returns but decided to retire at the age of 60 to play golf and spend time with his grandchildren. What would his estimated net worth be today? Certainly not $84.5 billion. In fact, it would be approximately $11.9 million, which is almost 99.9% .9 less than his actual net worth. In essence, the key to Warren Buffett's financial success is the financial foundation he established during his early years and his ability to maintain it well into his senior years. While his investing prowess is impressive, his secret to success lies in his patience and long-term approach. This is precisely how the magic of compounding works. Consider it from a different perspective. Warren Buffett may be the wealthiest investor ever but he isn't necessarily the greatest, at least not when measuring average annual returns. Jim Simons, who heads the hedge fund Renaissance Technologies, has compounded his wealth at a rate of 66% annually since 1988, which nobody else can match. As we just learned, Buffett's compounding rate is approximately 22% annually, or one-third as much. As I write, Jim Simon's net worth is $21 billion, or 75% less than Buffett's. But why is that the case, even though Simon's is a superior investor? It's because Simon's did not hit his investment stride until he was 50 years old, so he has had less than half the time that Buffett has had to compound his wealth. If Jim Simons had earned his 66% annual returns for the same 70-year period that Buffett has been building his wealth, his net worth would be an astonishing $63,901,780,748. Which is an unfeasible number. These numbers may seem absurd but they demonstrate how small changes in assumptions about growth can result in ridiculous numbers. So when we examine the reasons behind something's success, such as the formation of an ice age or Warren Buffett's wealth, we frequently overlook the most important factors that contribute to that success. I've heard numerous people say that the moment they first laid eyes on a compound interest table, or read one of those articles that illustrate how much more money you could save for retirement if you started investing in your 20s rather than your 30s, transformed their lives. Forever. However, that is doubtful. It likely surprised them because the results didn't align with their intuition. Exponential thinking is much less intuitive than linear thinking. For instance, if I requested you to calculate 8 plus 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 8 in your mind, it would take you only a few seconds. However, if I asked you to calculate 8 x 8 x 8 x 8 x 8 x 8 x 8 x 8 x 8, it would be too complex to compute mentally. Back in the 1950s, IBM produced a 3.5 megabyte hard drive. By the 1960s, storage capacities increased to several dozen megabytes, followed by IBM's Winchester drive that held 70 megabytes by the 1970s. Subsequently, drives became significantly smaller in size while also increasing storage capacities exponentially. For example, a standard PC from the early 1990s had between 200 to 500 megabytes of storage. 
And then, boom, things took off. In 1999, Apple released the iMac, which included a 6GB hard drive. By 2003, Power Macs had 120GB of storage, and in 2006, the new iMac offered 250GB. The first 4TB hard drive emerged in 2011, followed by 60TB hard drives in 2017 and 100TB hard drives in 2019. If we combine all of these, we gain 296 megabytes from 1950 to 1990 and 100 million megabytes from 1990 to the present day. If you were optimistic about technology in the 1950s, you might have expected that practical storage would increase by 1,000 or maybe 10,000 times. But few people could have predicted that it would increase 30 million times in one lifetime. Compounding is counterintuitive and even the smartest people can overlook its power. In 2004, Bill Gates criticized Gmail and wondered why anyone would need a gigabyte of storage. He was thinking about storage as a commodity that had to be conserved, but compounding can change everything quickly. The danger is that when compounding isn't intuitive, we tend to ignore its potential and focus on other solutions. There are thousands of books analyzing Warren Buffett's success but none are called. This guy has been investing consistently for three quarters of a century, even though that's the key to his success. Compounding is not intuitive, and that makes it hard to grasp. There are books about economic cycles, trading strategies, and sector bets, but the most important book is one that advises you to shut up and wait. It's just one page with a chart of long-term economic growth. The practical lesson is that the counterintuitiveness of compounding may be responsible for most disappointing trades, bad strategies, and successful investing attempts that it's natural for people to put all their energy and focus on trying to achieve the highest possible investment returns. After all, it seems like the most effective way to become wealthy. However, successful investing isn't just about achieving the highest returns because those tend to be one-time events that cannot be replicated. Rather, it's about achieving consistently good returns that can be sustained over the long term. This is when compounding really takes off. On the other hand, pursuing exceptionally high returns that are unsustainable often leads to heartbreaking outcomes. These stories will be explored further in the next chapter. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to be always aware of new videos. See you soon.